So we're here today with uh, uh, Gary Steger and Sylvia Martinez, and we're going to ask them some questions about education for our podcast. Uh, we're going to start off by asking you guys to tell us a little bit about yourselves. So I'm Sylvia Martinez. Um, I'm the co-author of Invent to Learn, Making Tinkering and Engineering in the Classroom. And uh, I've been working with schools, and lately it was schools on the maker movement. So using the tools and techniques and technologies of the maker movement to inspire kids and um, make classrooms really engaging and exciting. And I'm Dr. Gary Steger. I'm also the co-author of Invent to Learn, Making Tinkering and Engineering in the Classroom. I've spent 32 years trying to help teachers make sense of the constructive opportunities the computers provide for kids to, um, to learn by doing. I've taught everything from the preschool through the doctoral level, led professional development in the first schools in the world where every kid had a laptop, and have been an advocate for kids programming and building robotics and constructing knowledge for decades. So I'd like to get uh, straight to the heart of what we ask on our uh, podcast here, and that is, what is the purpose of an education? And you guys are probably the quintessential two people that I would love to ask that question to. I, I think there may be three purposes of education. Um, one is to democratize access to experience and expertise. If, if kids could have all the experiences and access to expertise that they needed at home, then, then a formal education would be um, unnecessary, but that's not the case. Um, I think the second thing is to prepare kids to solve the problems that their school never even anticipated. And the third role of an education is to introduce young people to things and ideas um, that they didn't know that they loved yet, to give them up exposure to things that they could fall in love with, that they become great at, that they, they can use as a, uh, a source of pleasure and um, opportunity as they go forth in their lives. I think that's exactly right. I think, um, you know, we we want kids to to be good citizens we want kids to be able to know and do things we want kids who can live in the world and coexist with others and solve the problems that are facing us as a as a society um, I think a rising tide lift all, lifts all boats. I think that um, education in the United States and global education is extremely important to make the world a better place all right so if how are we implementing that purpose currently is that is that happening or is that do we have a f long way to go on that well sure we can always do better I think there are amazing you know bright points of light across the country ac around the world where kids are really engaged and really being challenged and they're they're working with innovative teachers and innovative materials working on real projects maybe interning with with companies and businesses and nonprofits and um, you know doing things that really matter um, in a lot of cases however we could do a lot better we rely too much on um, institutions and things that make compulsory education more efficient but that don't necessarily really help learning you know lots of the things that we think of when we think of school the bells the desks the you know the classrooms the separated subjects don't really support good learning and yet we do them because it makes it easier to have a lot of kids go through a system and come out the other end well they're technologies of our previous era um, right Right, and the school has always been governed by the technology of, of its time, whether it be those desks or um, bell schedules or 25 little desks, one big desk in a room, or pencil and paper or slate and such. Um, and, and now we have opportunities to expand the breadth and depth and range of projects that are possible. And the, the intuitions of the maker movement of personal empowerment, of agency, of creativity, of solving one's own problems, of being self-sufficient and interdependent, um, stand in stark contrast from the anti-democratic notions of the school reform movement, of standardization, of compliance, of time on task, of achievement. And, and so at the very same time that we have this amazing array of new materials that can amplify human potential, it stands in stark contrast with, with a system that's going in the exact opposite direction. Um, the optimistic view of this, though, I think is something that, that Papert pointed out in 1990, where he said that when systems were in crisis, they tend to get more repressive, and that this is just the last flick of a dying dragon's tail. 
So you guys have had an opportunity to uh, go around the country, go to other countries, around the world, around the yeah. world talking to people about uh, maker education, doing this in, in real contexts. Uh, tell us a couple of stories that stand out in your mind of how this is fulfilling what you, you know what you described as the purpose of an education um you know i think generically it feels like people are gasping for breath you know they're just saying thank you so much for doing this there's this immense need and teachers know what's missing they know what to do and somehow they've been disempowered and somehow you know but this need is there so it feels like we're doing the right thing people are thanking us constantly for writing the book and it's you know it's kind of like we're saying to them you can take back your power there are things we know we know that projects and deeper learning experiences are good for kid and here's how to do it and you know we're running around like Johnny Appleseed you know throwing seeds all over the place and then people are thanking us for the apples you know and it's like they're the ones who are making these amazing things happen um, if we have any small part of it that's just you know it's great and it feels good but it feels like the right time it feels like something's about to happen you know you say this mat may be the last the last hope well I, th I think this is we've never had richer materials we've never had more powerful technology to realize the vision of people like Dewey or Malaguzzi or Pappert or Petrie or John Holt or Herb Cole. Um, and a lot of my work has been based on building a bridge between the progressive education community and the educational technology community because I feared that the progressive educators hadn't given enough thought to modernity and the educational technology community doesn't give enough thought to learning. Uh, but now there's this third community building a bridge too, which is these sort of informal learners, the makers, the hackers, the folks outside of schools who have remarkable instincts and intuitions about learning and trying to give them a vocabulary and, and situate their own personal experiences in a historical and theoretical context so we can bring those ideas into schools. Um, as Sylvia said, teachers are clamoring for this. That in their heart they know it's right and we're, we're giving voice and providing sort of a new magic carpet through the the, the materials that allow for the construction of knowledge in, in creatively expressive, intellectually deep ways that they wouldn't have had exposure to otherwise. So it sounds like this is just the beginning of the conversation. It sounds like we are, that the exciting place is still ahead. Um, well, we certainly hope so. You know, we hope this isn't just a new, new thing and, you know, and uh, next year, next w two years, it'll be some other new, new thing. Now, a certain amount of, you know, buzz happens around, uh, you know, buzzwords. Um, but I think this, this touches teachers in a, in, a, in, a, in a really personal way. And what we try and do is model what the maker movement says is that everyone can be a maker that the teachers have infinite capacity to understand these things. They do not have to wait for someone to hand them a pre-packaged maker curriculum because there are certainly, you know, things coming along that people are going to hand them pre-packaged things. But they need to understand that they can be the architect of, of these changes in their classroom. And, you know, how they start, they just have to start. And we need to redefine success and scale. Um, one, one of the things you hear over and over again in education is that this thing or that thing failed. Um, I was involved from the early 80s in teaching logo programming to children and teachers all over the world. And one of the favorite tropes, particularly in educational technology, is to kind of laugh off how logo failed, despite the fact that hundreds of thousands of children learned how to program and had the intellectual satisfaction that came with doing something formal and complex. We don't know how that, how that changed their lives. I know as, as a 12-year-old myself who learned how to program, it changed everything for me. I felt intellectually powerful and sophisticated and smart and creative for the first time in my life and I developed this sort of habits of mind, the ability to put myself in different perspectives to solve problems that serves me every day of my life. Um, so the teachers who are coming up to us and and are, and are grateful for whatever little contribution we made, um, who have been able to meet their heroes, who have become heroes in their own right um, for their own students, um, 
that's a level, an important level of success, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't diminish that. We should be building bridges to other communities. We should be figuring out ways to amplify our actions. Um, we should be taking action. We should be speaking out about what we believe. Um, but there's a very good chance that a year or two or ten from now, this will have been dismissed as you remember that time that we made things with computers, and and how it was a, it didn't raise test scores. It was it wasn't this or it wasn't that. Um, but if we wake up every morning and ask ourselves, how do we make this the best seven hours of a kid's life, and we now have wondrous materials that can that can make that even closer to being a reality, then I, I don't think we fail in any of our efforts. I think we're succeeding all the time, regardless of, of, of what the industry and the external forces that are sort of based on manufacturing crises and hysteria um, might dismiss our actions as. Well, I remember some similar experiences that you mentioned learning programming at a young age. You know, I learned that, I mean, I didn't call it being a maker. I just, I knew I wanted to invent things from a very young age. And it did. It felt very powerful. And I want to thank you guys for taking a few minutes to talk to us here for our podcast. And uh, tell us a little bit about Constructing Mo Modern Knowledge, how we can get in touch with you, and then we'll wrap it up. Well, Constructing Modern Knowledge is now the name of our company, but it's based on a summer institute for educators where folks have the luxury of time over four days to work with a r wide array of materials supported by an amazing faculty and punctuated by conversations with leading thinkers and doers and makers and inventors and scientists and historians and musicians um, so that they get to experience what it's like to be a learner in the modern age and what it's like to become great at something or to be en route to being great at something. Um, and we've, we've started constructing modern knowledge press which is a publishing company um, to amplify this message and to have it endure in book and digital form as well as published works by some of our heroes. And it's also the umbrella organization for our professional development efforts, whether it's speaking at conferences or mentoring in classrooms um, all, all, all over the world. So you can find out more about us and our work at constructingmodernknowledge.com. Excellent. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys. Uh,